during the pandemic, many Chinese students who had to go back home and were enrolled at universities in other countries just could not write their exams, for example, because their university internet needed them to use a VPN to be able to access the university network. And uh, their country does not allow the use of VPNs. Hi, and welcome to the third episode of the Surfshark Wave podcast. Today, I'm talking with the Internet Society, a global nonprofit organization advocating for an open, globally connected, secure, and trustworthy internet. And today, we have two great guests. First is Natalie Campbell, who is the Director of Community Organizing and Public Advocacy at the Internet Society. She analyzes how government actions could impact the internet and she also drives advocacy efforts to grow, protect, and defend an internet for everyone. She's also joined by Nettie Bayani, who is Policy and Advocacy Manager at the Internet Society. She works on promoting and defending an open, globally connected, secure, and trustworthy internet that works for everyone. Natalie's and Nettie's recent work has focused on the splinternet, examining how different paths could lead the internet to this worst-case scenario. Let's start with a simple question. Why is it so important to keep the internet open, globally connected, secure, and trustworthy? So the internet is this incredible, incredible force for good. It opens up countless opportunities for various facets of our lives. If we think about, you know, um, the importance of internet during the recent COVID outbreak that is still ongoing, right? The internet has allowed us to quickly shift to new ways of, new ways of working learning, or doing business online. The reason that we can do this is because the internet was built in a way that is simple and was meant to be globally accessible. So, you know, we didn't have to ask permission to develop new ways to use the internet when COVID broke out and we had to quickly readjust to how we were working and learning online. The internet allowed us to adapt to new ways of using the internet based on our new needs because it is a simple and globally accessible resource for everyone. So this, in a nutshell, is why it's so important to protect the internet as an open, globally connected, secure and trustworthy resource because this is exactly what makes it so great and such a valuable resource for everyone. Yeah, the internet has really changed in the past 10 to 20 years. Tell us more about Splinternet. What is it and why should I care about it? That's a really good question. So to understand what the Splinternet is, it's important to have a sense of what is the internet. It's important to remember that we can't take the internet for granted. The internet has been this incredible resource that has enriched the lives of people globally who have access to this resource. And we have a lot of people who are working to get access as well. Only a little over half the world is connected. And so there's a lot more opportunity to to bring the internet to the other parts of the world that want to have access. And I asked my daughter last night, what do you think the internet is? Because I wanted to get a sense. Sometimes it's hard for people to visualize what the internet is. And it is hard to visualize what the internet is. The way that she answered was, well, when I picture the internet and she's 10, is cables and you know wires all connected together and i said yes that's part of the answer but the important thing to know is that the internet is more than just a technology what separates the internet from an intranet for example is the way we use that technology and at the internet society we call it the internet way of networking because it is not another form of networking. And at the heart of this internet way of networking is a foundation of properties that we need for an internet to exist in the first place. It's what lets us send different types of content across the network. It's what allows us to innovate without having to ask for permission. It's simple, right? We spoke about simplicity before. Simplicity has been key to be able to have the internet evolve and still be relevant, just as relevant today and our new uses for it as it was three decades ago. Without this foundation of properties, if you don't have all of them in place, you don't have an internet. And so the idea of the splinternet is that the global internet that we know and enjoy today could splinter into a bunch of networks that no longer decide to work the internet wave networking. And so 
this is really concerning because if you have networks that, you know, whether it's a government that decides to disconnect itself from the internet, you know, that goes against this fundamental principle of decentralized management. And the internet is smaller because you now have a network that is no longer adhering to those foundational principles of the internet. Um, So ultimately, um, if the internet did split into a series of independent networks that no longer work together the way that we would in a global internet that fundamentally changes our experiences of the global internet, but all of the benefits that we get from the internet to be able to collaborate across borders, to be able to innovate together, to be able to have access to this global resource that has, you know, spurred economies worldwide, brought opportunities for employment, brought new opportunities for learning, that gets really restricted in a splinternet environment. And that's what's at stake with the splinternet. Um, And that would have repercussions on national economies, for instance, or the ability of people to do business online and gain access to um, consumer markets that they would not have access to otherwise without the global internet. It's not a place that anyone would who enjoys having access to the global internet would want to be on. I talked about simplicity before, right? The beauty of the internet, it is simple. It was built to be built upon and we can do so easily and without having asked for permission because it's the simple foundation that holds it together. The minute you have a splinter net, everything gets extremely complicated for everyone. Building on that last question, let's say my daily routine is wake up, Google the news, check out the first results and share them with my friends on Facebook. If my country creates its own network, what part of my routine would change and how? You know, this could honestly go in a couple of different directions, right? So in the most absolute sense, if there is a splintering of the internet, the websites and social media platforms like Google and Facebook that you just mentioned, either stop showing up completely, right? Like there was a day when Twitter users in Russia tried to access the website or the app and, you know, nothing showed up. In a different scenario, what could basically happen is that the address you type in of a certain website could take you to a different place. And basically that's a situation where you can't trust the addresses and the names of these websites to take you where you're supposed to go or where you want to go. And when the internet has splintered, if the internet splinters, these separate networks might just keep using the same addresses as the global internet right now that we have come to use and rely upon. But the information that you get from each of these different networks is what the particular government or company want you to see. So in either situation, the open, globally connected, secure and trustworthy internet that we have come to rely upon so, so much is not meeting our user expectations. In a slightly different scenario, what could perhaps happen is that there may be additional fees or some sort of like a custom associated with visiting certain websites where you're charged a little bit to go and visit a certain website. So, you know, you might see that some of your friends are on the global internet as we know it, and very few of your friends are on that splinter network that you are now part of. Let's give a hypothetical scenario. If I have a lot of friends worldwide and each one of us now belongs to a completely different splinter net, can we still keep in touch effectively and remotely? First and foremost, let's establish one thing at the absolute outset, right? The internet that we use to keep in touch with one another, the internet that we're using right now to have this conversation, it depends on the one global internet. There is only one global internet, right? One of the fundamental things that the internet did when it developed the way it did was it made the world seamless. Um, You know, to give you a very quick example, I was in India when I was writing my thesis for my master's program, and I used a home network to submit my thesis to my university intranet in the UK. So that is a very good example of how different networks on the internet choose to interact with one another voluntarily, independently, and efficiently. If we go a step further and we we take China as an example, I personally find it very hard to, to talk to my friends in China using any of the media or platforms that I would otherwise in my usual day to day life. This is primarily because of China's great firewall, right? So when you go to China and you get online, it's a completely different experience. You know, you're not on the global internet. You are on China's so-called 
safe version of the internet. So, you know, it's a regulated space where you see what the government wants you to see, you use the services that they want you to use, but it is not the same experience that the rest of the world has. I also know that uh, during the pandemic, many Chinese students who had to go back home and were enrolled at universities in other countries just could not write their exams, for example, because their university internet needed them to use a VPN to be able to access the university network and uh, their country does not allow the use of VPN. So, you know, there was a loss of opportunity because those students couldn't write their exams. In this scenario, what comes to mind is that, you know, we might just end up going back to snail mail or something that we're just not used to anymore, you know, because the internet has given us seamless, fast communication. And I think the question we're asking ourselves now is, do we want to go back to those erstwhile ways of communication. And that's really important for us here at Surfshark. We believe in an open and global internet. Having a VPN should be your constitutional right. <laughs> Let's imagine another hypothetical scenario. If the internet splits, how would it affect my access to different platforms online? Will I still be able to watch Netflix? The only way to answer that is it depends. In the worst case scenario, you might be in a network that doesn't give you access to a streaming service like Netflix at all. In another scenario, you might be able to access Netflix, but there might be a fee to access Netflix. The bottom line is that your experience of different services could be completely different based on the network that you're using. At the same time, you might have limited access to contribute to these types of streaming platforms, right? If you think about YouTube, uh, one of the things that makes it so great is that people can go on, upload content and gain access to new audiences. So if all of a sudden it's not as available in different, as widely as the global internet has made it, then you're not getting access to the full potential of content that you might otherwise have access to if everyone can contribute to this platform. If the state controls the internet, could they just decide who gets it and who doesn't? For example, if I make fun of the president, can he just not grant me a sole citizen access to the internet? So I think the broader issue that we're investigating here is, you know, the nature of the internet available to you as a citizen, right, in that country. So if your state or if your state government chooses to control the internet and regulate it in a way that the internet is not regulated at the moment or should not be regulated, that means that that particular country or government is not adhering to one of the most foundational properties that we need for the internet to exist in the first place, which is decentralized management, right? The internet is not owned by anyone, and at the same time, it is owned by everyone. So theoretically, a state, if it controls a network, it's pretty much the same as, you know, your workplace controlling your office internet, which means that the state then gets to have a lot of control over who gets access, what you can access, and who doesn't. So from being a permissionless model that the internet is right now, it becomes a highly permissioned environment. Let's say I log on to my social media every single day and someone gets upset, so I block them. Nothing changes. Then what's precisely the difference if we all decide to block a country? There is nothing that is particularly wrong with, you know, sanctioning bad behavior, right? It's one thing to block a troll on Twitter, right? But essentially what you're doing is that you're blocking their access from your content. And at the same time, you can't view their content as well. So this blocking has happened at a content layer between two individuals. But it is a completely different thing to block a complete country from the internet. On social media, as individual users, we get to choose who we interact with, right? And vice versa. The people we interact with also get to choose us or not. But this is a service on the internet. It is not part of the content layer of the internet. It is about the very basic infrastructure that ensures that common people, lay audiences in a country are connected to the internet. So choosing to block a troll on Twitter is not the same as choosing collective punishment for an entire population, right? Because if we choose to do that, we not only block livelihoods, we also block the voices of common people, you know, who have a right to share, you know, their opinion, access information, access the internet for education, you know, business, trade, employment, etc. 
but it seems like every time that there is a political event in the world someone is calling for someone else to be excluded from the internet and we must discourage these calls splinternet sounds extremely scary to me um i'm wondering what could i a simple person do to stop it from happening so i think the important thing to remember is that in the same way that the internet connects us all and that we are stronger together nobody has to do this alone we're all in this together There are lots of organizations and even lots of companies that are working to protect the internet. The Internet Society where we work is is one of those organizations. We believe that the internet is for everyone that wants it and we work for an internet that is open, globally connected, secure and trustworthy for everyone. So We welcome anyone to join the Internet Society and join us in this mission. We're almost 90,000 members strong now and anyone can join us as an individual member and and join in our efforts to protect the internet and I think this year is is probably one of the most, you know, important times to to work together to protect the internet in light of the growing threats that we're seeing of a splinternet. What could be the first countries affected by splinternet? Well, there's different ways to get to a splinter net. It's not new for countries to make efforts to disconnect themselves from the internet. That's definitely problematic because it kind of shrinks the global internet if you all of a sudden have countries making these decisions not to participate in the global internet. But some of the recent threats that we're especially concerned about is um recent calls to disconnect other countries from the internet. So as you know, since the war in Ukraine which is absolutely devastating, uh we've observed a lot of calls to disconnect Russian networks from the internet. And this has taken different forms um from straight up calls to internet governance bodies to disconnect Russian networks or to remove address space from the infrastructure of the internet. It's also been as a result of sanctions, right, that might restrict parts of companies or organizations that operate parts of the internet's infrastructure and and limit their ability to interconnect with networks in Russia. And this is some of the threats that we're most concerned about at the internet side recently because the minute that you start making political decisions about who gets to have internet access, this goes against the fundamental apolitical nature of the internet. And it also sets a really dangerous precedent that could snowball into that global splinter net if you will rather quickly right now the efforts might be targeted towards trying to restrict access to russian networks to the internet but what happens when there could be another country that is the target of condemnation or the balance of power shifts and if we set this precedent that it's okay to make political decisions about who gets access that leads us down a really scary downward spiral that puts the access of the global internet at risk for virtually everyone we are seeing a high number of internet censorship all around the globe are there any signs of splinternet happening right now Well, there are signs of the splinter net. As I mentioned, there are governments that have made decisions before to disconnect uh networks in their countries from the internet. There are calls to disconnect other countries from the internet. Thankfully, the example I mentioned before where there were calls to internet governance bodies, they uh resisted those asks to disconnect Russian domains from the internet. But we are still very conscious that these could happen we do know that there are sanctions that were put in place that are having an impact on company ability to connect with russian networks so we've definitely seen signs um and we've seen actions indirectly as a result of some of these sanctions seemingly that have resulted in networks being disconnected from the internet russia is a very overused example of internet censorship what are some of the other cases of internet censorship that you could tell me so i think it's important to to remember that you know right now the focus might be to disconnect networks in russia from the internet so if any one of these politicized actions to disconnect networks from the internet happens then that sets a precedent and as i mentioned that the focus might be russia today but the focus could be literally any other country in the future and by setting this precedent that goes against the fundamental principles of a political nature of the internet then that puts a lot of other countries at risk we know 
that there's a lot of countries in Africa, for instance, that are watching this and they're worried that maybe one day they might be the target of some of these efforts or, you know, that authoritarian countries might be looking at this as well. And, and this could be feeding into their own playbooks as well, right? So the splinter net is not just a risk for networks in Russia right now. It's really a risk for everyone around the world because everyone loses when we lose the global internet. I just like to add that, you know, every single voice, every single effort that we can get in joining, you know, all of us in this space who are trying to protect and uphold the open, globally connected, secure, trustworthy internet, every single voice counts, you know. So even if you go out and just amplify this message on social media, you know, bring this to the notice of your community and your neighborhood, ask your kids to talk to their friends. And if you have a little more time, please write to your policymakers, give them a call, please try and uphold these values that bring the global internet together, right? It brings all of us together. And any attempt to sort of divide the global internet as we know it is going to be divisive in society, in economies, politically, in every single aspect of our lives. So every single effort matters at the moment. Every single voice raised matters. Um, so please take this opportunity to go out and defend the internet that we have come to rely upon. Let's say if I were to travel to China today, many of the social media networks would not be available to me. So I would have to use a VPN like Surfshark to overcome those restrictions. But if the splinternet happens and I were to live in China, for example, is there any simple way like a VPN to hack and overcome splinternet? That's a tricky question. I guess the answer is it depends, right? As I mentioned before, the only way to be part of the global internet is to adhere to that foundation of critical properties. So if you were a, you know, in Russia and able to set up a network that adheres to those, that foundation of what the internet needs to exist, then that would be your connection to the global internet. But it becomes really tricky if there are authoritarian governments trying to prevent you from connecting to the global internet. So, you know, in, in school, we were taught how electrical signals pass between two cells, right? So if you can imagine two cells and an electric signal passing from one to the other, that's basically every single network on the global internet. The, the networks choose to connect with one another in the most efficient manner possible, right? So if that means that my connection has to travel from India to the US and then back to Switzerland for me to be able to communicate with you, the network independently decides the best route that, you know, this communication is going to take or this data, these data packets that are being transferred between you and me, that the route that they're going to take. The minute that an authoritarian regime tries to control the internet, what it's doing is on an infrastructure level, blocking this movement of data packets in a reliable, efficient, voluntary, independent manner. And which is why in countries that have attempted to do this, we have such a different experience of the internet. And it becomes, to my mind, really hard, even with a VPN, which is often criminalized to then go on back or even attempt to go back onto the global internet and access it the way that we would otherwise. Okay, now I want to talk on an aspirational level a bit. What is the internet? How has the birth of the internet changed the world? Earlier on, when we were talking, I mentioned that the internet needs to exist is this foundation of, of principles, right? That make sure that at its core, you need to have these principles to have an internet in the first place, the internet way of networking. But what that does is it gives us an internet that exists. It doesn't necessarily give us the type of internet that we want. A lot of organizations and countries agree that the aspirational state of the internet is one that is open, globally connected, secure, and trustworthy. And so, you know, there's lots of things that we can do to work towards this aspirational state of the internet. And it's, it's really important to work uh, to protect um, what we call enablers of a thriving internet as well, because it can be the difference between just having a network, but also having access to private communications, or low barriers to access to join the internet. These are all important qualities that we need to support to have the kind of internet that we want both now and in the future. Let's speak more about internet society. What is 
Internet Society. What do you do? And could I join the Internet Society myself? Internet Society is a global nonprofit organization whose mission is to make sure that the internet is for everyone. So what we do is we focus on building, promoting, and defending an open, global connected, secure, and trustworthy internet. We're nearly 90,000 members strong and anyone can join us. And what we work on is things in those three different areas to make sure that the internet is the type of internet that we want today and tomorrow. But yeah, anyone can join us. And we really do believe that the more we work together, the stronger we are to protect the internet. And I would say if there was ever a time to be working together to protect the internet, now is that time. You can go on our website. There's the option to join as an individual member, and then you get access to participate in some of the Internet Society's work, um, whether that's protecting encryption or whether that's resisting the splinternet or joining in efforts to grow the Internet. Being an individual member gives you exclusive access to getting deeper insight into some of our efforts in these areas of work and tons of opportunities for you to join in, and we need all the help that we can get. We also are open to organizational members, uh, which is a different category where companies and nonprofits can join as their organizations and participate as at that level of membership as well. Thank you so much for talking to me. It was extremely interesting to talk with you and learn more about SplinterNet. And I'm pretty sure that our viewers enjoyed it as well. It's our pleasure. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Guys, don't forget to follow us for more podcasts just like this. We are coming to you with fresh, new, and amazing content every single week. So subscribe and follow us. Stay safe, stay connected.